a couple in a couple of days we're coming into Rosh Hashanah which brings us into a jubilee year right now we're in a Shemitah year which is seven times seven Sabbaths so we're coming into a jubilee year we're seeing a lot of convergences in time in this season we're in a sabbatical year we are in a Shemitah year we're coming into a jubilee year but it's actually 70 sabbaths since Joshua entered the promised land Joshua and Caleb so this jubilee makes 70 sabbaths of years when Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land are you with me Moses laid his hands on 70 elders and the Spirit of God for eldership came upon them so God is releasing his spirit on some people to begin to bring them into eldership so the Holy Spirit is looking for some people to begin to descend upon to raise them up Ezekiel said that there will be a performance of the word of God so that his word will no longer be delayed are you with me so as the gates of the promises open God is looking to bring expeditiously the performance of his word can you go to five people and say no more delays in every promise that God has given to you so we're entering into a season touch your neighbor and tell them we are entering into a season of the fulfillment of promises but you got to make sure that you are in compliance and obedience because time and chance are about to converge in a jubilee year it means that there's a cancellation of debt somehow touch your neighbor and tell them somehow God will bring you over the top if you believe it somebody shout hallelujah in the house of God tonight Jubilee is the same as Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. Jubilee means 50. Touch somebody else and tell them the Holy Spirit is looking to land upon your life in fuller measure. It means that there is restoration because in Jubilee all lands everything lent had to be restored so touch three people and say there's some stuff that is coming back to you if you believe it somebody shout hallelujah now lift up your hands Say this prayer after me. Repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, let the gates of time, let the gates of this new season be lifted up and their doors open. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I access my new season. I enter into new beginnings, in the name of the Lord Jesus, every promise that has been spoken over my life, I enter into the promise now. I enter into the promise now. I decree and declare there shall be a performance of every word that God has spoken over my life. In the name of Jesus, I activate the winds of restoration. Restore everything. The years alone. 
you may be seated touch your neighbor and say we'll continue tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at the gf1 center we're going to administrate all these things in prayer tomorrow morning hallelujah i thank god for every single one of you i thank god for your lives we are coming into a defining moment a defining season the operant numbers are 7, 70, and 50. This is the end of a seven-year period. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So we're in a new beginning season. God's doing a new thing. Don't joke with Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1 to 3. Because it's a, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on Isaiah chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 61, Isaiah chapter 62, and Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1 to 3. Pray and declare every day those scriptures in the gates of time. And the best gates are the 3 a.m. gate and the 6 p.m. gate. I'll continue on that tomorrow. Could you go with me in the scriptures? I thank God for the leaders of Global Force, uh, Joey and Pastor Matthew and all of you that, that are in the leadership of Global Force. And beyond that, we thank God for the father of this house, my mentor, Dr. Hurd, and what God is doing in City. But most of all, I thank God for every single one of you. Understand that God's eyes are, ro are roaming to and fro, seeking those that he might show himself mighty on behalf of, whose hearts are perfect towards him. God is looking for sons. Remember... Uh, two Fridays ago, two Fridays ago, I taught something on Isaiah chapter 5 that my beloved said to my well beloved, my well beloved said to my beloved, my beloved established, I planted a vineyard upon a fruitful hill. And I said that word fruitful means ben, is a Hebrew word ben, which means sun. And that word hill means horn. So Jesus establishes his kingdom on the principle of sonship, on a son of strength. Are you with me? And I did say to you, so you cannot divorce the kingdom and the manifestation of the kingdom from sonship. So the spirit of Elijah is operating now to restore the heart of the fathers to the sons. And the heart of the sons to the fathers. Otherwise the kingdom cannot manifest. And I said to you that because the kingdom is built upon the principle of sonship. Then God is looking for sons who can represent him. So I said to you that God created the earth in six days. And on the seventh day he rested. And he rested from all his, what, work. And that word work in the Hebrew actually means representation. So work is not about the labor and the toil of your hands. It's about how you represent God in the spheres that God has given you to, to labor in. So Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. And that word business in the Greek is actually is a word that means father. So what Jesus was saying is, I am about my father. So if you're going to represent God as a son, then you must be about the father. And if you can't be about your spiritual father, then you can't be about your heavenly father. Because the natural comes first, then the spiritual, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I said to you then last week Friday that the, what is preventing us from becoming sons is the spirit of the orphan. Right? Even from the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve were orphaned because they cut themselves off from their father. So the spirit of the orphan came, of which Jesus said, I will no longer leave you as orphans. And so what has happened, especially, even especially in the African-American, is that they were orphaned because they were cut off from their fatherhood. And that's what's happening to a lot of us because let many people are coming 
the statistics show that they're more single parent families. And so the spirit of the orphan is rife. And with the spirit of the orphan, you end up misusing and abusing resources, authority, power, and your sonship privileges. So God cannot use you. So you become disqualified. So last week, Friday, uh, Friday, we were breaking the power of the spirit of the orphan over your lives. And now tonight, I'm going to teach you about five levels of sonship. Because you, if you're, we're going to see the kingdom come, of which Jesus taught us to pray, saying, pray this way, thy kingdom come. The kingdom cannot come if sons are not in place. And the glory cannot permeate the earth because God has no sons to pour his glory through so that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God so that the glory of the Lord can cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Can I go a little bit deeper? So let's look at uh, a couple of scriptures. I'm gonna, we're going to read three scriptures and then I'm going to begin to exegete from those scriptures on five levels of sonship. The highest level of sonship is what God is looking to grow you to. Because until you arrive at that level, God cannot entrust to you the responsibilities of his glory, the stewardship to, to, to adjudicate in a righteous way the, the resources and the administration of the glory of God. Understand the kingdom is about process. Number two, the kingdom is about the administration of God's glory in every sphere of society. Are you with me? So as sons, we have to try to understand how do we tap into the realms of glory and administrate that glory into the earth realm. Now, I don't know where some of you come from, but I learned that from my mentor, Richard Hurd. <laughs> So I don't know whether you're listening to what he's saying when he comes in here to teach. May God open your ears. Could you go with me in your scriptures to Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8. And let's read from verse 14 all the way to verse 19. I read... From verse 14, the New King James Version. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Next verse. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're not sons, but we are children of God. Next verse. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Touch your neighbor and say, no suffering, no glory. It's called the fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. Next verse. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So touch somebody and say, everything that you have been going through is because God is preparing you to reveal his glory through you. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation is eagerly waiting or waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So the whole earth has gone into labor pains. The earth is in intercession. The stars in the sky are in intercession. The trees of the field are in intercession. The earth is in intercession. 
The birds of the air are in intercession, crying out for some sons to begin to manifest. Are you with me? So God is looking for sons. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 37. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is teaching on parables. Parables that pertain to how the kingdom of God is going to manifest. He teaches on the parable of the sower. He teaches on the parable of the tares and the wheat. And then, after teaching on these three or four parables, he begins to give an explanation to his disciples in verse 37. And he says, and he answered to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of God. So Jesus is the sower. Next verse. The field is the world or the kingdom. And the good seeds are the sons, not of men, not of God, but the sons of the kingdom. But the tears are the sons of the wicked one. Touch your name and say, the devil also has sons. And the devil is raising sons too. Next verse. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the what? The end of the age and the reapers are the angels. So as much as God is looking for sons of the kingdom, Satan is rearing his own sons of his kingdom and he's planting them to confuse the sons of God's kingdom so that we can't discern the difference. Now let's go to 1 John. Chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I read verse 1, then I will skip down to verse 12. His, the apostle of love says in verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So he addresses little children. Now, if you take a breather for a moment, in Romans chapter 8, he says that the children are heirs of God and joint heirs, but God is looking for sons. In Matthew chapter 13, he's, Jesus says he sows sons into the world to bring his kingdom. And here, John is using a descriptive term, little children. These things are right to you, so that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate, which is the Father, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, verse 12 says, I am writing to you again, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Next verse. I write to you, fathers, so first, little children, now I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men. So there's little children, there's fathers, there's young men. Because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. Next verse. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men. Because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Heavenly Father, give expression to your word that your kingdom may begin to manifest in a greater dimension in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may put my slide. First, second, the introduction. 
To get anywhere, you must know two things. Where you are and where you want to go. If you don't know your destination or if you don't know where you're going, anywhere becomes a destination. Touch somebody and say, you've got to have a vision. Just understanding where you want to go will not enable you to get there. You must recognize where you are and if you don't know who you are or where you are in your spiritual growth, then you're just like a man that is walking in an unfamiliar forest. You are lost and you will walk in circles. So you got to know where you're going and where you are along the road to your destination. Are you with me? You need to understand who you are in Christ and what the Holy Spirit of God is doing in your life at this very moment. If you don't understand the phases or the seasons and the phases of your walk in God and God's dealings with you, then you will be lost because you don't understand God. You don't understand his outworkings in you and what he's willing in you to do of his good purpose because you're lost. Are you with me? So the Holy Spirit has to teach you to use your map, which is the word of God, and your compass, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so that you aren't lost, so you can arrive at where you need to be. Next slide. So Christian growth and development follows basically the same pattern of human growth and development. In human growth and development, you start as a baby. Then you become an infant or a childling. Then you become an older child or a little child in intellect. Then the fourth level is to become a youth under 20. Then the fifth level is you become a full-grown son of God. And the sixth level, you become a father, which is the Greek word pater. So you have five stages of sonship. In the Greek, the first level, a baby, is called nepios. And that's what Paul describes as a newborn babe. The second level of sonship is the Greek word paideon, and then which is an infant or a childling. Then you have an older child, which is technon. And then you have a young man who, uh, who is nianiskos. And then you have a full-grown mature son that is called Huos. Then you grow to becoming a father, which is the Greek word pater. Can I take it off the top? So you grow from a nepios, from which we get the word nappy. Then you become a paideon. Then from Pideon you go to Technon. And then from Technon you go to Neoniskos. And then from Niskos you go to Ahuos. The word that God uses to describe what the earth is waiting for, that the earth is interceding for, that all creation is groaning for, is the sons of God, which is that word Huos. Which means a mature person, a mature son, who is like Christ in character, in nature, and lifestyle. Because anything that God wants to do, when he looks off the balustrades of heaven, he wants to see a reflection of himself. He wants to see you as, uh, as through a mirror reflecting him. You must radiate his glory. 
So the eldest or the highest level of sonship is that word huos that you find in Romans chapter 8, that the whole earth is groaning and travailing, awaiting for the manifestation of the huos of God, one who resembles Christ in character, resembles Christ in nature, resembles Christ in lifestyle. Because God is not as interested in the destination as in the process that you're going to have to go through to attain that destination. By the time you get to the destination, you must be looking like Jesus. You must be smelling like Jesus. You must be thinking like Jesus. You must be conducting your lifestyle like Jesus so that you have now grown up into the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. It's about your conformity to God and not about God giving you some tangible assets to boast about. And so, therefore, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus uses the same word, he was, as the seed that he sows into the world. The seed that God is looking to sow into the world systems to begin to redeem the world systems back to himself and begin to take those world kingdoms to become the kingdoms of our God as the same sons called Hewos. So he's looking for seed called sons. Hewos that resemble him in character, that resemble him in nature, that resemble him in lifestyle. Those are the people that he wants to sow into the media. Those are the people that will, want to, that will take over from Oprah Winfrey. Those are the people that God wants to sow into government and politics. Those are the people that God wants to sow into the educational system to reform it. Those are the people that God wants to sow into the business world and the finance world so they can become conduits to channel the wealth of the wicked into the hands of the righteous for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. And in case you didn't know it, we have now entered into the time of the greatest transference of wealth. Because the 70 year period, which is the 70th jubilee since Joshua and Caleb, they entered the land. And God said, I will give you houses you didn't build. I will give you vineyards you did not plant. He said, as you drive out the Canaanites, you begin to take over. Touch your neighbor and say, somebody is sitting on your booty. All the, I, I don't mean this, upon your spoils of war. All the booty, all, all the gold, all the silver, all the blessings, the Canaanites that are occupying and working your vineyards and still living in your houses and touch your neighbor and say, God is looking for some fewer sons to begin to drive them out and take over. If you believe it, shout hallelujah, somebody. But how many fewer sons are there? Where are you? In this stage of development. So let's go a little bit deeper here. Are you with me? So, at new birth, next slide. In John chapter 3, verse 2 to 3, he talks about Nicodemus. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. So being born again does not necessarily equip you to enter the kingdom. It equips you to see the kingdom. Except you be born of the water and of the spirit, he says, you cannot enter. Are you with me? So when you're born again, you become a new creation in Christ. You're now filled with the Holy Spirit, and you are now a spiritual baby in Christ. Touch your neighbor and say, you may be an adult in the flesh, but the moment you get born again, you're a babe in Christ. Are you with me? And this is the word, next slide, that this describes the word napios. Somebody who wears nappies. Only babies wear nappies. So the word of God is there describing a spiritual baby. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1 he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, 
even as unto babes in Christ. So a babe in Christ is carnal. All he thinks about is what he's going to eat, what he's going to wear, the car he's going to drive, the kind of wheels on the car, and so on and so forth. And about his status and recognition in a world that God has already condemned. He's a product of the flesh. When he comes to church, he's saying, God bless me. God give me. God I acquire. God I claim. God I possess. I require. Touch your neighbor again and say, I dolatory. Because you're a babe in Christ. All you think about are the fast cars and the things that can accessorize your ministry to give you a semblance of success. And God says the degree to which you identify to the, with the world is the degree to which he will reject you. Are you with me? Can I go a little bit deeper? Ephesians 4.14, as a result, we are no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by winds of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. So at that level, at the babe level, you don't know what to believe. You don't know where you stand. One minute, you're on this side. Another minute, you're on that side. One minute, somebody brings a high for looting word and you're hooping and everything else and you think you've had a good service, he's just talked nonsense. You walk out of here, you can't even remember what was taught. And he says, by winds of what? Doctrine. Of which Peter says, in the last days, many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. So if you don't know doctrine, you will fall for any other doctrine. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You cannot have God without the Word. The more of the Word is living in you, the more of God you have. You cannot have God without His Word, because God is His Word. To have God, you must have the Word. You must be doctrinally astute. Many will depart from the faith because they can't discern the doctrine of God from the doctrine of the devil. And how many of you know that the devil preaches the word too? Didn't he say to the word, the one who wrote the word, the one who created the whole universe, it is written. He preached the word to the word. So he knows the word better than you. Because he was there when the word wrote the word. So touch your neighbor and say, you need to know the word. Otherwise, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. Next slide. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He is a nepios, an infant. That's why Paul says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. As newborn babes, what are you supposed to desire? The sincere milk of the word of God. So just... As a physical baby drinks milk from her mother's breast, God says you should be drinking the milk of the word of God. And he doesn't just call it the milk of the word of God. He says the sincere milk. Because you can have a preacher that is preaching the word, but the word is not sincere. And if the word is not sincere, then the spirit of deception is encoded and embedded in the words. And all you come out with is a good word, but being deceived. Desire, he qualifies it, the sincere. Because anybody you listen to, you need to understand that his motives are pure. And he's not discouraged. Because if he's preaching out of discouragement, he's communicating the spirit of discouragement embedded in the word. The sincere milk. It must be the right word. Sincere. That you may grow thereby. So without the milk of the word, you're not going to grow. Touch your neighbor and say, you better start reading at least five chapters of your Bible every morning. If you manage to read five chapters every morning, you can cover the scriptures in one year. If you read ten, 
You can cover the scriptures two times in a year. And some didn't even read their Bibles this morning. And you want God to move in your life. If you only know John 3.16, then the Holy Spirit can only give you a revelation out of John 3.16. So you limit the amount of revelation you can receive by your ignorance in the word. Matthew 11.25. At this time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Do you know that when you're born again and you, have, you, you, you experience that goosebump feeling for the first six months to a year, everything is honky-dory. Everything is just, you're floating on a cloud. You're drifting as if you're high, high in the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? And that's when God starts to birth a lot of revelation in you because your, your infant, your heart is not filled with all sorts of trickery, cunningness, and malice. So God can speak the unadulterated word of God. And that's where at infanthood, you begin to have revelations of your future. So Joseph, as his infanthood, has a dream that the sun and the moon and the stars are bowing down to him. Touch your neighbor and say, go back to the dreams you used to dream when you were a child. That was God speaking to you. And if you've forgotten, ask the Lord to lift the lid off your subconscious so you can remember those dreams. Can I go a little bit deeper here? Little children are held in bondage to the material things of this world. And I put a note there, unlike a physical baby, spiritual babies can stay at this stage in a lifetime. So you will always grow physically. But spiritually, you can always, you can end up staying as a baby in Christ for the rest of your life because you refuse to grow. You're not doing what is required to grow in Christ. Touch your neighbor and say, you can't be a spiritual baby for the rest of your life. God is looking for sons. So touch your neighbor and say, grow up. Can I go a little bit deeper here? The second, the second level is the word, next slide, paideon. And this word is the next stage, which means a young child or, or, or a, a childling, a paideon. The first thing we see about him is that they are humble. Matthew 18, 4, whoever then humbles himself as uh, this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom. So after your goosebump experience, for the first year after you got born again, after you've been floating on a cloud for one year and you've been in second heaven, God brings you back to earth. And it sounds as if the Holy Spirit has left. That's when God starts to deal with you. Now the high is gone. You're back to reality. And he now starts to take you through a humbling process. Because God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in the due season he may exalt you. Now he's dealing with all, starts to deal with all the issues in your life. Just like when your child's two to three years old, you know, they want to touch everything. They want to break everything. They want to have their way on everything. And sometimes you're going to have to start to smack them and correct them and discipline them. Because you're now you're humbling them, teaching them how to be obedient, how to be well behaved. Touch your neighbor and say, in the spirit realm, God started to teach you how he will smack your backside so that you can learn how to, be, how to behave, so that you can be learn, learn how to be obedient. So you go through a humbling process and you come to church and say, Pastor, I, I don't know what's happening, but I can't feel God anymore. I, 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 God just doesn't seem to be there. Uh, he's not blessing me anymore. I don't seem to be doing as well as I used to. Yes, because you're going through a stage of humiliation. Because he cannot use you with all your itchy little thinking and your ideologies and your mindsets and all that stuff in your life. He's got to strip you. He's emptying you of your bad self. Hello? And it's not easy. And if you don't understand what you're going through, you think that God doesn't love you. Why isn't everything working out? It's not working out because you're trying to endorse your own plan when God has his own plan for your life. So there's a dynamic tension. 
Because the flesh is pulling you this way and the spirit is saying, no, you've got to come this way. And so you're in a struggle like Paul was in a struggle. All the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do are the things that I do. Who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? Oh, wretched man that I am. Because you're now in a dynamic tension. The world is pulling you this way. You want to identify with your friends in the world. You want to identify with the boys in the hood that you used to hang around with. But now you're a Christian. You can't hang around with them. And God's trying to get you away from them, separate you from them, while you're still trying to go back to them because you get your identity from them and God wants you to start to get your identity from Him. You still want the flashy cars so that everybody can acknowledge you and say you're part of them and hey, you've arrived. Hallelujah, you're on the sea. And God is saying, no more scene for you. This is the backside of the desert where you're going to learn how to do without those things, where you're going to have to learn how to trust in me, where you're going to have to learn how to depend on me, where you're going to have to learn to look at me and not look at your friends, where you're going to have to learn how to identify with me and not with the boys in the hood. And this struggle can go on and on as long as you refuse to yield to the dealings of the Holy Spirit in your life. You prolong the season. So David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So God begins to humble you because he wants you to begin to grow. You know, in the kingdom, the way up is down. In the world, the way down is in the devil's kingdom. So what does he ascended mean? But that he first descended to the lowest parts. And he that descended to the lowest parts, God raised him to the highest and exalted him above all and gave him a name above every other name. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9 to 10. So the way down in the kingdom is up. Are you listening to me? Because God cannot use anybody who he doesn't em empty of self. He even Jesus emptied himself of all his glory, did not consider equality a thing with God to be grasped, and became of what? No reputation. If God is going to use you, he's going to strip you of your self-image, he's going to strip you of your brand, he's going to strip you of every uh, reputation you have, including the accolades you put after your name. Michael Adephas, Doctor of Divinity, Archbishop Cantar, Pope Emeritus. By the time he's finished, he's taken all those titles away from you. You are nobody and nothing. God only uses nobodies. Amen. He became of no reputation and humbled himself and was found in the fashion of a man and became obedient even unto death. The anointing is not to raise you up. The anointing is to first kill you. God gives you an anointing to kill you. The anointing is so that you can die. Die to yourself. Die to your flesh. Die to your ambition. Die to your own aspirations. That's what the anointing is for. Because God cannot use a body that's not dead and buried. Because the gospel is about not the death of Christ, not about the burial of Christ, but about the resurrection of Christ. Everything that God is going to use has to go through a death, a burial, and a resurrection cycle. If your marriage is going to go through a death, burial, and resurrection cycle, your finances are going to go through a death, burial, and resurrection cycle. Everything, your relationships are going to go through a death, burial, and resurrection cycle. Because the glory of God is that everybody said you're finished. And then God begins to do a new work in your life. So that everybody that looks at you can say, this is the doing of God. It is marvelous in our sight. You will not be able to take the glory because no flesh will glory in the presence of the Lord. Matthew chapter 19 verse 14, he said, let the children alone. Do not hinder them from coming. Because how many of you notice your children at that age, they're always, mommy, mommy, mommy. And they're running to mommy. Daddy, daddy, daddy. And they're running to daddy. Because at that level, God is teaching you how to be a God chaser. You're chasing after the eternal father. If you don't get things right at this level, it can impair your growth at every other level. That's why you can't just sit under anybody when you're a little child of God. 
You need to sit under somebody who teaches you how to chase the father, how to run after the father, how to ask the father, how to seek the father, and how to knock on his door every morning and say, Abba, Father. Ah, God. Don't hinder them from coming to me. Because at that level, you just want to be full of God. Paul was in the backside of the desert for 14 years because he was a God chaser. David was in the backside of the desert for so many years. That's where he wrote all the Psalms, all his love songs to God in the backside of the desert because at that level they became God chasers, little children. Suffer not the little children to come to me. Next slide. 1 John 2.13 says, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I am writing to you, Pideon, children, because you know the father. At that level, you're learning how to know the father. You're learning how to be intimately acquainted with the father because it's about intimacy. You're learning to be transparent and honest with the father. Just like you're chasing after your mom and your dad as a little child. So, and you always want to be, you always find security in, in your mom's arms because there's intimacy. That's what God is looking for. If you don't develop that intimacy, you will, you will always try to do things without God because you haven't developed that bond. That's why the worst thing you can do is if a child is born prematurely and you put the child in an incubator, you have messed the child's life up. Because in those few moments when the child comes into the earth, it needs to bond with the mother. There's a spiritual bond that takes place. But once you put the child in the incubator, the child is alone. It develops a sense and a spirit of independence and struggling for itself. That's why... Those of you mothers, so those of you single women about to have children after you get married. If your children are immature, insist that they bring the incubator to your bedside. So that you can bond with the child before they put the child in isolation. Because it will affect them. At that level, the child develops a bruising in his spirit man that will affect his life forever. If he doesn't get the healing required. If somebody doesn't know what to do. Next slide. At that level. A young child at 10 years old. All he has learned to do. Is love his parents. They have learned to become intimate with their parents. Because children learn from what they see. More than what they are taught. They mimic their father. That's why Paul says, imitate me as I imitate the Lord. Because our children learn the, by imitation. Not by what you say, but by what you do. So the little children in our church, at home, they spend a lot of time mimicking the way I preach and teach. And they pretend that they're Pastor Yemi. So I've got to be very careful what I say, what I do. Because those, they absorb every single little thing. If you look at the sons of Richard Hurd, you'll find that a lot of them speak like him. They act like him. They preach like him. Because anytime he stands here, he's imparting of his spirit that God put upon him. Touch your neighbor and say, catch the spirit of the house. Next slide. Are you learning anything? I haven't started. Ah, this is a good one. A Pideon should be also under the tutelage of his spiritual father in the church. Jesus called his disciples Pideon. His disciples he referred to as Pideon, young children. Little children, have you caught any more any fish? Are you listening to me? He called them little children because they backslid. As soon as Jesus goes to the cross, Peter says, I go a fishing. He was trying to go back to what God divorced him from. 
And how many of you know that night they, they toiled, they toiled all night long and caught what? Nothing. And when they see Jesus cooking fish that they were toiling for all night long and caught nothing, Peter jumps out of his boat, his humanly contrived system, and goes to Jesus and Jesus says, did you catch any fish? He says, no. He said, feed my sheep. Then he says, do you love me? Second time, feed my sheep. The other time he says, do you love me? Three levels of tutelage. Before you become effective. So Galatians 4, 13 says, a child, as long as he's an heir, does not differ from a slave or a servant, although he's owner of everything. He's under guardians and tutors or managers until the date set by the father. Who's the father over there? God? No. That's your spiritual father. So those of you that God has planted in global force, those of you that God has planted in city or wherever God has planted you, you cannot leave until the father that God has put you under releases you. And if you say God said, God is the same God that can speak to the spiritual father as well. Case in point, Moses at the burning bush. Good. Moses has this whole encounter with God. But immediately after the encounter, Moses goes to Jethro, his spiritual father. Did God make a mistake of putting Moses under Jethro? No. Does God bypass the authority he set up? No, because everything with God is done decently and in order. So Moses goes to Jethro and says, I had an encounter. God spoke to me at the burning bush. And then Jethro says, Moses, go in what? Peace. He releases Moses. And I know that Jethro would have laid hands on Moses because this is the same Joshua. Laying hands is a doctrine of Christ. And this is the same Joshua that teaches Moses how to lay hands on 70 elders. So Moses, Jethro had to release Moses even though God had spoken to Moses at the burning bush. You got to get the protocols of the kingdom right because the kingdom is about protocols. If you mess up the protocols, you can become a spiritual bastard and you may have a church of 10,000, 20,000, 22,000 people with an orphan spirit like Gideon had and all you're communicating to your hearers is the spirit of the bastard or the spirit of the orphan because you divorced yourself from your spiritual father before time. Next slide. Are you learning anything? I didn't come to hype you. I came to ground you. In this season, it's a teaching anointing that God has released upon his kingdom. Because we are so many people that are just shouting hallelujah and we have empty heads. Are you with me? And if you're going to have any, the, the, your, the foundation of your life determines how high and how far God can build, your, build with you. And to have a foundation, I don't want to get into this. <laughs> to have a foundation, the foundation is doctrine. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1, not laying, uh, Hebrews chapter 5 last verse, then dovetailing into Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. How, uh, not laying again the elementary, elementary principles of the word of God. Elementary. Elementary. Yeah. And he goes into the elementary principles, which are number one, repentance from dead works. Number two, faith towards, towards God. Number three, the doctrine of laying on of hands. Number four, the doctrine, no, no, number three, the doctrine of baptisms. And there's not just two, three baptisms in scripture, there are 15. So if you only know the two or the three, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and water baptism, you're lacking doctrinal as a foundation in the other 15 baptisms, the 13 baptisms. Then the doctrine of laying on of hands. Then the doctrine of uh, resurrections. Then the doctrine of eternal judgment, which are what? The elementary, the first course. So if you don't know the first course, how are you going to get into the second course? The Christology, the Pateriology, the Pneumatology, the Soteriology, the Hamashiology, which is the second course. 
before you now get into the Isisology, before you get to the demonology, the angelology, and all the other logoses. Of which now when you have all the layers of all those doctrinal foundations, you now have a foundation in your life that God can build with. Because if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous one do? Touch anybody and say, we're going back to school. At a, as a spiritual, the next level is a spiritual teenager, which is called technon. The spiritual teenagers in the body of Christ are described as the word technon. Because at this level, now you have been taught to actively seek God. You're not just a God chaser, you're a God seeker. You're not just a God asker. Remember, first level, ask. Second level, seek. Next level, third level, break the door down. No. And if he doesn't answer, I'm breaking the door down. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Because the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent what? Take it by force. So when you're knocking on that door, he doesn't answer, you break the door down. And take, his, take access to him. Just like Esther. Esther violated the protocol to get what she needed for the advancement of the kingdom. Little children, John 13 Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will do what? Seek me. As a spiritual teenager or technon, you must move and transition from a God chaser to a God seeker. As a God chaser, you just want his loving presence. But as a God seeker, you need to know how to do everything right God's way. Because there's a way you can do things and it brings ruin. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. Are you listening to me? As a God seeker, you want to see God in everything. When she's talking to me, I'm seeking God. What is God saying through her? When there's a situation, what is God's purpose in this situation? What, what, when there's a, a choice or a decision to be taken, what is God's way? Because you can have two right things to do. Which one is from God? Which one is not? <laughs> you become a God seeker. I want to see God in everything. I want to see God in the music. I don't want to see performance. I want to see the anointing, not a performance. Because if you haven't spent time in the presence of God before you came out here to sing your song, all you're doing is performing. But when you have spent time in the presence of God, you're ministering from the Lord unto the people, not ministering out of your flesh. If you haven't spent time from the Lord, all you're doing is just performance. So all of you guys, Warren, all of you take your cue. You can't fool me. I'm a spiritual man. So when you're in the flesh, I know it. You can play all the notes. They may sound good. They may hit high, high frequencies, but it's still flesh. Because heaven is not singing that song. You're singing your own song. Next slide. Little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate. So as a spiritual teenager, you're struggling with sin. This is the level where you're struggling with sin. You see Delilah. And you know you've been delighted by Delilah. But you're, 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 you're still seeking God, God. Deliver me from Delilah's. Deliver me from all my vices. As soon as we finish service, some of you are going to smoke a cigarette. Touch your neighbor and say, you're still struggling with sin. After service, you're going to say, I did well. So you're going to eat a whole big bowl of calamari. <laughs> Or barbecue ribs. <laughs> because we're struggling with sin issues in our lives. So as, as a spiritual teenager, you, you, you have an identity complex. Am I, I'm confused. How many of you know most, most teenagers are confused? Because they're in between uh, childhood and adulthood. So they're confused. 
and a spiritual teenager is trying to discover his identity in Christ. So sometimes he's confused. He doesn't know where he stands. And all it takes is somebody to say the wrong thing to him and he's messed up. Like Malanga and Balanga. <laughs> are you listening to me? And many of us are stuck at this level. So we don't know what to believe. We don't know who we are. Who we are supposed to be. We don't know our identity. Jacob was at this level. And so he goes into a wrestling match with God. Because at this level, he's confused. His name is Jacob, supplanter. His name is Jacob. The label the world put upon him is deceiver. His name, the label they put upon him is a, a, a thief, a trickster. That was Jacob. And anytime they called him deceiver, he said yes. Anytime they called him supplanter, Jacob, yes, here I am. And in that wrestling match with God himself, with the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord says, I know you've been confused as a teenager, Jacob, but it's time to grow up. Your earthly identity is Jacob, but I'm changing your name. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob. Your name shall be called Israel. Israel was his heavenly identity, while Jacob was his earthly identity. So the earthly identity had to give way to the heavenly identity, and he comes out of it with a limp. Why? Because... God cannot use you unless you have a limp. Because a limp means that he has just broken the load-bearing joint so you can no longer stand in your own strength. God now has to become your crutch. So that you can sing that song, leaning on the everlasting arms of God. Now you're operating in Israel. Your heavenly identity, no longer Jacob, your mundane identity. And many of you, some of you, listen, I'm just describing where some of you are at so you can know where you are along the road. So you know why what is happening to you is happening to you. So you can take heart and take courage. Because many of you sometimes want to give up because you don't understand why you're going through what you're going through and the stage of God's dealings in your life. Am I helping anybody here? So he commands them. They are commanded not to sin. But if you do sin, don't forget, you have the advocate, the mediator, who's interceding for you before the throne of grace. So that you can run to him so that he can forgive your sin. First John 3, 7, he says, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself. At this level in your adolescence, you better stop masturbating. Masturbating is idolatry. Because you're exalting your own pleasure above God's will. So at this level, he's gone quiet. And all the men that are smiling, they're guilty. I can see. <laughs> are you listening to me? At this level, everyone who has this hope Fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, you've got to fix your eyes on him. He will keep him perfectly, them whose hearts are, uh, are, uh, are fixed upon him. But at this level, you're going through a season uh, of purification. God's trying to purify you because you made the mistake of praying Malachi's prayer. Melt me. Mold me. <laughs> now he's melting you. If he's going to melt you, that means fire. He will purify the sons of Levi with his refining fire. At this level, 
You are going through the refinement, the fire. Many of us pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I want to add something. In this hour, start to pray for the baptism of fire. He said, I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We're in the fire part. Because he can't use you with all the impurities in your life. Because anything you do will just corrupt any, anything. If it, with the impurities in your life, anything you do will be corrupted. And this level, the fire of God comes. is burning the dross out of your life. And so, anything you do, your friends are fighting you. Because God is using them to chastise you. As iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. When two iron sharpen one another, sparks fly. And you're wondering, why must I always get into trouble? Because God is putting you in trouble. And then you make the mistake of saying, God, teach me how to love you some more. And you know how God answers that prayer? Next week, next day, he puts you in front in the midst of people that hate you. The only way God can teach you to love is by putting you with people that hate you. So he'll make everybody in the office hate you. Because it's nothing to love them that love you, but it's something to love them that hate you. Now you're learning how to love. And after he, you've learned to love them that hate you, you, you now say, it's now give him enemies. So you stop praying for your enemies to die, and you start to, what did Jesus say? Love your enemies. So now you're saying, God, kill him. God, judge him. No, you say, God, Bless that man, he's my enemy. <laughs> I better leave here, I've got to close. Next, next slide. However, if they sin and confess them, they are to know their sins are forgiven. Because at this level, the enemy is trying to heap a whole load of condemnation upon you and guilt. But God says, keep on running to him and understand this, that if you keep on confessing and repenting, he will forgive you. Next slide. I can't continue. He says, Take none, children are to abide in him. First John 2 8. Little children abide in, in him. There's something called abiding. That means you're living in him. You're always in his presence. You're always, men always ought to pray. You're always praying. So you're living in his presence. David, at this level, could not do without the presence of God. He's king, he's king, but five times a day, he's holding on to the horns of the altar. One day, he says, in your courts, is better than a thousand. And with all the affairs of state he had to deal with, he's learning how to abide in the Lord. So that all his decisions are taken out of the presence of God and not out of his intellect. They are instructed to love honestly. Little children, let us not love with word and with tongue. In other words, at this level, God says you've got to stop being a hypocrite. Action speaks louder than words. Touch your neighbor and say, put your money where your mouth is. I'm tired of people say, I love the Lord. And God so loved that he gave. So the measure of your love is determined by how much you give. Greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life for his neighbor. So look at your neighbor eyeball to eyeball. And if you don't have a neighbor, look at the woman next to you, eyeball to eyeball. And say, will you lay down your life for me? Will you die in my place? Tell them I'm waiting for an answer. Yeah, because if you can't lay down your life, you're not ready for God. God always wants to see in you the sacrifice of Christ. When your life reminds him of the sacrifice he had to give, his only begotten son, then now you're gaining credit, with, you have credit with heaven. When you speak, God will honor your words. When you decree a thing, it will be established because now you have weight. Because the degree to which you honor your own word will be the degree to which God will entrust you with his word. If you're unfaithful with your word, you'll be unfaithful with God's word. Because he who is unfaithful with little will be unfaithful with much. 
who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. Heaven can only entrust people who God knows honor their own words. Then heaven says, now that you honor your word, I can entrust you with my word. If you're a liar, I can't give you a revelation because you will lie the revelation. <laughs> that this level, you're still struggling to have Christ formed in your character. Christ formed in your personality. And God says, keep yourselves from idols. Next slide. Now we go to young men. I am writing to you, fathers, because you have come to know the one who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have had victory. When you become a young man, you're, you're now overcoming the flesh. You're walking in the victory. Now you're becoming more than a conqueror through Christ. If you're going to be more than a conqueror, that means you're going to have to come over many battles. <laughs> if you're an overcomer, there are many things you're going to have to come over. Now you are learning to subdue the flesh. Not I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. I die daily that Christ may be formed in me. Now you are an overcomer because you are subduing the flesh. Oh, who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? You learn. I bring my, my flesh under subjection. That's what Paul says. So that the Spirit of God can have his way in my life. At this level... Young men, next, next, next slide. At this level, now, young men, because you are strong, God's word remains in you. At this level, now you're abiding in the word. You're rich in the word. You're living out the word. You're walking out the word. You're speaking the word. You're acting the word. You're behaving the word. You're doing everything by the word. Because now you have strength. And now you're walking in victory. Now you're walking in victory over the evil one. You are valiant. You have power with God. That doesn't mean you have authority. You can have power without authority. Authority is the right to use the power. But first God has to give you the power. And when you have that power, you want to display, Holy Spirit, fall down. And everybody's falling down. My friend, God didn't say fall down. He said arise and shine. this level, you can withstand the trials. At this level, you endure things because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is perseverance, patience. So God will stretch you. He'll delay all your promises so that he can build your capacity for patience. I can teach capacity building than any corporate entity. They don't understand capacity building. Give a person a promise, then delay the promise. <laughs> Now you learn endurance. You learn long-suffering, which is called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Touch three people and say, go after the fruit. Next slide. So we've talked about the Nepios, the joy of a new life in Christ. We, then you go to Pideon, you begin to know God intimately. Then you come to a stagnant stage of growth where you learn to deal with the world by dealing with sin and to have Christ formed in you, and having a real love for God, the church, and the world. Then you come to the young man, Nianiskos, overcoming the flesh, victory over Satan, not ignorant of the devil's devices, being strong in the word. Each stage is, a, uh, is, is dovetails from the previous one. If you don't go for the first stage, you can't get to the second stage, nor the third stage. And now let's look at the last stage. The heroes! The heroes, the whole earth is groaning, awaiting for the manifestation of the sons, the heroes of God. This is who God is looking for. Touch your neighbor and say, you need to grow up to this level because these are the ones that God wants to use in, in to bring the kingdom down. These are the ones, they, that are led by the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. Now you have broken the flesh. Now you have destroyed the flesh. Now you have subdued the flesh. You have subdued your earthly appetites. You have subdued your material desires. Now you are just given holy to the Holy Spirit. Now you understand when the voice of the Spirit is speaking to you. And you don't confuse the voice of the Spirit with the voice of your mind or with the voice of the devil. 
Now you understand the Spirit because the Spirit and the Word are always in agreement. When the Spirit speaks, you go to the Word to understand this is what the Spirit is saying through the Word. Because the Spirit never speaks. I'm tired of these prophets of prophets a whole lot of stuff and they don't know the Word of God. Are you listening to me? At this sun level, you begin to receive the revelations of the kingdom. At this sun level, you're actively seeking the Lord. At this level, you have strong handle over sin on the sin issues of your life. Now, you're a son. The only people that God hands inheritance to are sons. How many of you? Do you have children? How many? How old? Are you going to buy him a Mercedes at two years old? He won't even know how to drive it. And even when he's 11 years old, you give your son a Corvette, what are you doing? You put a death wish over him. Because you're going to want to drive that Corvette at 200 miles an hour down the I-95. And he'll kill himself. God never blesses his people with what they cannot manage. So to one, he gave one talent according to his ability. To another, two talents according to his ability. Another five talents according to his ability. Because God never blesses you with more than you can manage for him as you mess up and you kill yourself. So a lot of the things that we call blessings may have just come from the devil himself. Because the devil is quicker to bless than God is. God is slow to bless, the devil is quicker to bless. Ishmael always comes before Isaac. Touch people and say, don't settle for an Ishmael blessing. Ishmael is a product of the flesh. Settle for Isaac. And Isaac delays in his coming. Ah, are you listening to me? Isaac delays. He takes time to manifest. That's why God has waited all these years for the manifestation of the kingdom because he's been waiting and looking for sons who can carry the glory, sons who can steward the finances, sons who can administrate the glory in a righteous manner, sons that can walk into the White House and say, thus saith the Lord, and by this time tomorrow, and when tomorrow comes, it happens. And like what this lady has done, Kim, for the first time, God has found a daughter and she only got born again a few years ago but she refused to sign a marriage certificate because her name will be on the marriage certificate that I endorsed same-sex marriage and that's a document that will be in the archives so for once somebody stood up even if it's against the law of the land but to have her name on that document saying I endorsed gay marriage what's going to happen when she gets to her eternal reality and I wish all Christians would be like her America would change if you don't stand for something you will fall for everything that's the kind of person that God looks for somebody who will stand for the righteousness of the kingdom that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They said, Nebuchadnezzar, we know that you're king. But we serve somebody that calls himself not just a king, but the king of kings. So if there's anybody we're going to bow to, then we will not bow to your laws. We'll bow to his laws because his laws are superior. Not only that, he's the same God that created you and created me. So if you like, throw us into the fire touch your name and say if you don't go into the fire you will never see Jesus Jesus only comes through the fire when you pass through the fire I will be with you the fire will not kindle over you the Nebuchadnezzar said didn't I see throw three men into the fire I see a fourth man who is like the son of God which means Nebuchadnezzar knew about God all that time he just chose not to serve him next slide Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. That's what Jesus said, the Father said of Jesus, this is my beloved viewers, in whom I am, what, well pleased. At that level, you love your enemies and you pray for your persecutors. At that level, when you enter into a place, you enter into the office, they know that God has arrived in the office. 
because you carry you're the embodiment of his presence these are the people that Jesus said as a sower he's going to sow into the world what we have been doing as Christians is been, we've been sowing, sowing children we've been sowing, sowing infants into the world and they mess up because they're just children because they're not ready to handle the things of eternal consequence and eternal glory they're still going through light afflictions so they cannot handle the heavier eternal weight of God's glory God is looking for us sons who have been through all his dealings now they can stand and the earth will begin to salute you when you go out the sun shall not smite you by day the sun will bow down to you the moon shall not harm you by night the moon shall turn the tides for your favor if you don't believe me ask Esther a thousand will fall at your left and ten thousand at your right because when you show up on the scene you know that the God of the angel armies is attached to you wherever you go he's following you because he says that is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear ye him this is the season we're entering into God is looking for his sons there's an anointing that is getting ready to begin to fall upon the sons of God who will rise up and do exploits but they that know their God those that are intimately acquainted that have experienced and tasted that he's of his goodness now they will get up talk to people and say it's time to begin to do exploits there's an enablement there's an empowerment coming upon your life in this new season touch your neighbor and say we're entering into a new season we're entering into jubilee can you begin to shout your jubilee has come your touch your neighbor and say it's jubilee because suns are rising you shall arise and begin to shine for thy light has come and the glory of god is risen upon you if you believe it shout hallelujah We're entering into 5776, which is a jubilee year. And it's actually the 70th jubilee since Jacob and Caleb, Josh, Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land. So a, gate, a gateway is about to open, a spiritual gate to enter into your promised land. Listen carefully. And the first use of 70 in the scripture, they, Jacob and his 70 sons went into Egypt. God is looking for sons who he can send into strategic places like Egypt. Everything that God, Egypt is a type of the world. Are you listening to me? He's looking for sons that he can sow as seeds. When Joshua, Joseph landed in Egypt, he transformed Egypt. He built infrastructure. He built systems. Are you listening to me? He brought God into Egypt. God is looking for a son that will be a salt of the earth and a light to the world. And if you're going to be a light because it's time to arise and shine, God will never send you to a light place. He will send you to a place of darkness so you can be the light in darkness. So the people will come to the brightness of your rising. Many of you want God to send you to a comfortable place. He doesn't send salt into a comfortable place. He sends light into darkness so that you can be the light in Houston. You can be the light in Beaumont. Are you listening to me? And Moses took his hand because his spiritual father taught him you can't do all this work by yourself. Select 70 elders. And then when you lay the hands on them, I, the Spirit of God, will descend upon them and raise them up into spiritual eldership and leadership because they have become sons of God. Now I can sow them into the world system because they're now sons. Are you listening to me? So the Holy Spirit is looking to anoint people into eldership in this new season. Just 
just lift your hands and say, don't begin to pray. Don't pass me by. God, I've come this, some of you, we've come too far to turn back. So just go through the next couple of seasons of dealings because he's looking to touch people. We're entering into 57, 76, the seventh year jubilee. God, the Holy Spirit is looking to come down and seal people with the spirit of sonship, with the spirit of eldership, because they will use their lives as a living sacrifice to God. Let's begin to pray, Holy Spirit, I pray that I will pass all the exams. I pray that I will pass all the testings. Holy Spirit, I pray, rest upon me.